am so glad you're here for another episode of Mechanism Monday, where every Monday we write out the electron pushing arrow mechanisms for different organic transformations. In last week's video, I asked if you could solve the mechanism for this organic reaction. So if you haven't had a chance, pause the video now and try it independently. And make sure you stick around to the end because I'll give you another mechanism to solve for next week's video. When this illustrated diamide reacts with bromine under basic conditions, we end up generating this cyclic molecule. And it begins with a step that's probably not very intuitive. However, we should note that it's very difficult, even under basic conditions, to turn amides into carboxylic acids. So it's unlikely that the hydroxyl group, or the hydroxide, I should say, which is a negatively charged OH group, would attack this carbonyl carbon. Instead, what might happen if we actually draw in these nitrogen to hydrogen bonds, we can deprotonate, do a deprotonation reaction, where we deprotonate one of these hydrogens. So this hydroxide will come and potentially deprotonate this hydrogen. And then what's likely to occur next is that these electrons will actually come down to form a carbon to nitrogen double bond, which will result in a cascade of electron movement in which these pi electrons come to form a negatively charged oxygen. So then this actually generates a pretty unique species, which can kind of be thought of as like an enolate. So remember in enolate chemistry, we have deprotonated the alpha carbon, alpha to some carbonyl compound, and in doing so, what we generate is typically a carbon to carbon double bond where the carbon is acting as a nucleophile. So the enolate species looks similar to this where you have a negatively charged oxygen and the carbon to carbon double bond results here, except for now instead what we actually have is an NH group. However, in this case, what actually would end up happening is that our enolate species, which is a pseudo enolate, I should say, it's not rigorously an enolate, but it would still behave the same way, where these oxygen electrons can come down to reform our carbonyl group, our CO double bond, and then these pi electrons will actually come and do a nucleophilic attack on bromine to end up generating bromide and kind of doing like an alpha halogenation, which means now what we've generated is actually going to be a nitrogen to bromine bond, which is a pretty unique bond that you don't encounter very often in organic chemistry. So now we have this NH group, and then also it is attached to this bromide. And this unique portion of the molecule is gonna undergo a rearrangement that's pretty cool, where these carbon to carbon electrons will actually do a rearrangement reaction. Well, they will actually come over and attack this nitrogen, which is actually gonna end up making bromide leave as a leaving group. And notice that this carbon position here is actually now gonna be the one that's bound to this nitrogen. And instead, our nitrogen is gonna end up being like an NCO group which is known as an isocyanate. So the product of this reaction forms an isocyanate. And you'll see what that structure looks like when I draw it in, but basically you have a carbon to nitrogen bond, which we have formed at this position. There is a nitrogen to carbon double bond that's gonna be formed at this position, which means this is a carbon, and then that now has a carbon to carbon oxygen bond, or a carbon to oxygen double bond. And of course this means that it must have also undergone a proton transfer, because notice we've also included our NH group here and that's no longer the case. So in addition to a proton transfer, you end up generating this isocyanate. And from here, now a similar process can occur. So remember previously I drew in these nitrogen to hydrogen bonds. So if we do that again, and we have more hydroxide present in our solution, then this hydroxide can actually come in and deprotonate another one of these nitrogen to hydrogen bonds. And that, again, is gonna cause these electrons to shift over to make a carbon to nitrogen double bond, also shifting up these electrons to make our negatively charged oxygen, where we've regenerated what is kind of like a pseudo enolate, like we did previously. So now this generates a product where we're faced with our pseudo enolate, where we have this carbon to nitrogen double bond, a negatively charged oxygen at this position. There should be one, two, three bonds until we get to our cyanate, which is again that nitrogen to carbon double bond with the double bond to oxygen. And now when these electrons come back down, allowing us to use our pseudo enolate to do a nucleophilic attack, it's gonna attack this carbon position, which is going to move over to these pi electrons to being located on the oxygen. But it's also gonna help us close our ring we we'll are notice that we end up with nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen. Here we're also gonna generate nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen. And we're also reforming one of these carbonyl functional groups. So then now that we've closed this ring, we're actually most of the way to our final product. Where you end up with a nitrogen at this position, a nitrogen at this position. Here we already have our carbonyl group. We still have the NH group located at this position. Here we have our negatively charged oxygen because we kicked over these pi electrons, so this is gonna be negatively charged. And we still have this nitrogen to carbon 
carbon double bond located in between them. So then again, we've generated a pseudoenolate where these pi electrons can come down, and this can come and attack our water molecule, which we generated when we deprotonated the amine using our hydroxide, which means we're basically just doing a proton transfer, allowing us to regenerate our hydroxide and also generate our final product. So this is the last step in this mechanism in which we're generating this cyclic ring. So I know that the first step is pretty unique in that we're deprotonating an amide, which typically you would think of as being a basic functional group, but it can also ha be deprotonated as well. From here, this generates what I'm affectionately calling a pseudoenolate, which can do an alpha halogenation, except for the alpha group, instead of being a carbon, is a nitrogen. This will brominate the nitrogen, allowing us to do a rearrangement reaction in which, following a subsequent proton transfer, we also generate an isocyanate functional group. This is going to allow us to do another deprotonation of an amide group to end up generating another pseudoenolate which can be used to do a reaction with that isocyanate and close that six-membered ring. Subsequently a proton transfer gets us to our final product so it's a pretty unique reaction. If you enjoyed this week's mechanism give it a thumbs up down below and for next week I'd love to see if you could figure out the electron pushing arrow mechanism for this organic reaction and make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you never miss out on another mechanism Monday. I'll see you next week.